All right, so we're going to talk about clean buildings and far UVC light. So when we talk about indoor spaces and improving the air quality in indoor spaces, I think we can all agree that the best answer is typically to bring in more fresh air, right? So when you talk about air, uh, air changes per hour in your building, most buildings have an air change rate of five to three to five air changes per hour. Maybe in extreme cases, you end up in a hospital and you're talking 10 air changes per hour. But when you get into 30, 60, or even 322 air changes per hour, really, sorry, really you're, you're talking about a completely different system. Trying to achieve that just through your HVAC system would mean substantial upgrades in both your processing units as well as your ducting in the facility. So that really becomes impractical, right? Your rooms would start to feel like a wind tunnel. And as a result, this is where UVC disinfection can come in, right? UVC systems have made huge advances in the last 10 years or so. And this has enabled us to achieve hundreds of effective air changes per hour. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So just as a recap, when we're talking about light that comes from the sun, as far as light, we typically break it down into three categories, OK? You have your, inf your uh, infrared light, which is the longer wavelengths. This is when you stand in the sunshine. This is what you feel the heat from the sun. Okay, you have your visible light, which typically runs from about 400 nanometers up to 750 nanometers. These, this is the light that we see every day when you're seeing me. And then when you're talking about UV light, this is shorter than 450 nanometers. This is what we commonly associate with sunburns. Okay, and traditionally, we've always been told that you know, UV light should be avoided and these types of things. So when we talk about inactivation in spaces, this is something we need to account for. Now, UV light can be broken down into three categories, UVA and UVB, which if you ever look at your sunscreen bottle, those are typically the wavelengths or the categories that are listed on your sunscreen bottle, and UVC, which is largely filtered out by the upper atmosphere. Now, UVC can be further subdivided into far UVC, which is basically wavelengths of shorter than 230 nanometers. So we've known for over a century that we can use UVC to disinfect spaces. Okay? So for example, operating rooms. We can also use it to disinfect tools, such as dental tools. Okay? But traditionally, we've used 240 or 254 nanometer light to, disin to achieve this disinfection through mercury lamps. But the problem is, is that when you expose people to 254 nanometer light, you can induce cataracts, you can induce skin cancer, and all sorts of other negative human health impacts. So wouldn't it be great if we could have a wavelength of UV light that inactivated viruses and bacteria, but didn't have the same negative health impacts? And this is what Dr. Brenner and the group at Columbia University discovered. They found a wavelength that would have the same detrimental effects to viruses and bacteria, but wouldn't have those same detri detrimental effects to humans. And that's what 222 nanometers is, right? 222 nanometers is the wavelength of light that effectively penetrates bacteria and viruses, but doesn't have those same negative health consequences, right? And you can see that in this slide, where it doesn't penetrate as deeply into the skin. It gets largely absorbed by the dead skin layer. And it doesn't penetrate as deeply into the eye. It's absorbed largely by the tear layer, right? So this is fantastic. This then enables UV light to be used in occupied spaces, right? No longer are we just disinfecting spaces that are empty, now we can be actively disinfecting spaces while people are there, OK? <coughs> so let's talk about air changes per hour for a minute, right? If we think of the dirty glass as our pathogen-laden room, right, and we think of the clean glass as one air change, right, I think we can all agree that when we take the clean water and we dump it into the glass of dirty water, we don't end up with a glass of clean water, right? we would end up with something that would be less dirty. And the same is true with our pathogen-laden space, right? When you take one air change and you put it into a space, you typically see a concentration reduction of about 65%. So you may be thinking, great, well, if I can do 10 air changes per hour, like a hospital, right, then I can reduce that to 6.5%, and that's got to be good. But the challenge is, is that that's from your initial starting concentration. So that's like saying the sick person left the room 
and now I'm going to disinfect it, and an hour later, I have it down to 6.5%. And this is why it's not enough to just look at air changes per hour. You know, we need pathogen inactivation systems in our building, and we need to be able to combat those pathogens at a very high rate, because if we're going to interfere with future pandemics and sickness, you know, the flu moving between people, it's very important that that's done while the people are in the room, not just after they've left the space, okay? So let's talk a little bit about how we can map the efficiency of your UVC system or your UV disinfection system into a more traditional air changes per hour, right? So the important thing to understand is that when you talk about UVC disinfection, the efficacy of your UVC dis disinfection system will change based on the virus that you're trying to inactivate. So you can see in the table here, right, if I'm trying to inactivate MRSA, now I'm in this particular case, I'm trying to achieve a three log reduction or a 99.9% .9 log reduction. I need 15 millijoules per centimeter squared, okay? But if I'm using that exact same UVC disinfection system and I'm trying to inactivate E. coli, I only need nine millijoules per centimeter squared, right? So when I map this into an, an effective air changes per hour, when I'm talking about E. coli, that same UVC system will be 60% higher efficacy because I'll have 60% 60, 60 more effective air changes per hour because I require a lower dose of UV in order to inactivate that particular pathogen. So let's talk about some specific different types of UV systems in buildings, okay? So you may be familiar with induct systems. This diagram is from the Air Movement and Control Association, Inc. And what they are showing here is UVC lights on either side of your cooling coils in your HVAC system, okay? And the advantage of an induct system is that they're usually less expensive to install because you're putting in fewer of them, okay? And you also get a secondary benefit. Not only are you, are you inactivating the viruses that are present in the air, but you're also preventing growth on your cooling coil, which improves the overall efficiency of your HVAC system, right? So in this particular case, it's a double win, all right? But the challenge is, is that it's limited by the HVAC capacity in your building, right? So if you say, well, my HVAC is providing five air changes per hour, well, if I now am bringing in 50% fresh air, so two and a half of those five air changes per hour are fresh air, then the other two and a half are recirculated air. So the best that my UV system can do in this particular case is to inactivate the pathogens in that other two and a half air changes per hour. So my overall system capacity is limited by my HVAC capacity. And this is further complicated by variable systems, right? When you look at VVT systems in your buildings, your building management system, it's, it's sensing people in the space and saying, okay, you know what? I need to provide more air or less air. Well, it's more difficult to figure out the efficacy of your UV system if, that, if the amount of air being pumped into a room is constantly changing, right? If, you, if there aren't enough people in the room to cause the HVAC to kick in, you're not getting any disinfection. So let's talk about another option. Another common option is upper room UV, okay? And this slide is from the Center for Disease Control, all right? And basically, what an upper room UV system is says, okay, well, I can't irradiate, you know, historically these systems have used 254. I can't directly expose the people in the room to the UV light. So instead, I'm going to shine it over top of their heads, right? And you can see it's moving horizontally across the top of the room. And this is great, right? it doesn't matter what my HVAC system capacity is, I'm actually getting UV disinfection in the room where I've got this installed, okay? And if you think of your HVAC, right, going back to the, early, the previous slide, right, you might have in a 10 by 10, a fairly small room, a tiny little grill that's providing fresh air into that space, right? So you're trying to pump air through that tiny little grill. But now, when you look at an upper room, the entire ceiling space becomes a disinfection zone. Right, which is great, right? Now we've significantly increased the amount of air that can easily flow through the disinfection zone and get disinfected, okay? So moving on, this, this image was taken from a paper called Far UVC Effectively Inactivates an Airborne Pathogen in a room Size Chamber, okay? And I've added the human silhouette for a sense of scale. 
all right? So this is where UVC really becomes interesting. When we talk about 222 nanometer light, okay, now we can actually expose the entire room, not just the top one-fifth or one-sixth of the room. Now the entire room can become a disinfection zone. So now we're disinfecting the air, the surfaces that the UV inner light interacts with, right? And when we talk about, and in this paper, they, you know, their analysis was we got up to an equivalent air change of 322 uh, air changes per hour, right? That's pretty spectacular, right? And that's the way they achieve that is by saying, hey, you know what? We're, in, we're disinfecting the entire space all at once. So now, if, when you think about the upper room, right, you had to move the air up through that upper portion, which is fine, right? It, it worked. It worked successfully to combat TB, right, for many years. But now we can actually look at disinfecting the entire space. So let's talk about certification for a minute. It's important to understand that all the certification agencies, such as UL and CE, they all look at how much light is being put in the, through a seven-foot plane above the ceiling, or sorry, above the floor, OK? And this is basically the assumption that most people are shorter than seven feet. So as a result, as long as we're making sure that the amount of energy coming through that plane into the lower space isn't exceeding the recommended guidelines, then that should be OK. OK? So I always recommend that you look for UVC systems that have uh, UL or CE certification, because these are the insurance companies that are backing up these labs, typically. And you want to make sure that your insurance provider is going to continue providing you coverage, right? A couple other things you might want to, or you definitely want to consider when you're looking at selecting a UV system, OK? There are three standards that should be met. The first one being an electrical safety standard. And most, most vendors will do the electrical safety testing. But what we've seen is many vendors claim CE or UL based solely on electrical testing. And that's not enough, right? You also want to make sure that there is photobiological testing that's been done. This is making sure that the amount of energy that is being put into the occupied space does not exceed guidelines, recommended guidelines, OK? standardized guidelines. And then the third piece of certification testing you want to make sure has been done is control safety. Okay? And basically, what control safety does is it says, look, if there's a fault that occurs somewhere in the system, could I end up violating the photobiological guidelines? Right? And they look at fault testing, and they say, OK, you know what? If you fail in any of your circuits or your software, you will degrade gracefully and not end up in an overexposure situation. Okay. So we're here at the Smart Building Conference. And in today's society, we can definitely see how UVC systems and pathogen and activation systems can be used in our smart buildings. Right? You can put them into your spaces and have them provide feedback as to whether or not they're operating correctly, whether or not they need lamp changes, whether or not they need maintenance. You can also be driving them with the sensor data that you're getting from your other sensors, right? Occupancy sensors, schedule, time on, off, number of people in the room. Uh, you can look at time of year information where you say, you know what, we're not in a pandemic, we're not in flu season. OK, we're going to dial the energy down a little bit. We're going to consume less energy, not have it running at 100%. But then when we get into flu season or pandemics, we can actually scale them up. So all of these things become possible when we start looking at smart buildings and intelligent systems. So, so if you have never seen a, a far UVC system active, you're welcome to come by our booth uh, at 3K600. And we have some operating in the booth, and we'd be more than happy to let you get your hands on one. All right? Any questions? OK. Thank you very much.